What is up, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of Catholics with Bibles. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining me today on this glorious, glorious day. Why is it a glorious day? Well, it's because we're releasing this podcast on Ascension, the Feast of the Ascension. And this is like a, like a big feast day. And it, well, it depends where you live, right? It depends what country you live. Um, a lot of dioceses within the states, they moved the celebration to Ascension, to Ascension Sunday. But like technically, it's, it, I mean, just numbers wise, right? Um, and like Drew, what we know by reading the New Testament, uh, it's Thursday, right? Um, this, it's, it, right now it's today for watching this because it's released on Thursday. Um, so happy Ascension, happy Feast of the Ascension. Um, odds are if you live in the States, you're celebrating this on Sunday, like officially, officially. Uh, but it's like a huge deal, right? Um, I, I'm actually surprised to know, to, to, remind, to remember how many people forget that after the resurrection, Jesus hung out for, for 40 days. Like he... He, he appeared to the disciples and apostles, and we only have a few instances of when that happens, like recorded, but it happened for 40 days, right? So over a month of Jesus being like, yo, what up, guys? Yo, what up, guys? Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Don't doubt. Hey, here's some more uh, teaching, and here's some more clarification, and like all these things. For 40 days after his resurrection, and it's only then, after 40 days, that he was then ascended into heaven. Uh, real quick, also remember that there's a difference between ascension and assumption. Uh, Jesus ascended into heaven because that's where he uh, deserves to be properly speaking because he is the second person of the Trinity. Um, and Mary was assumed into heaven uh, because she, by nature, she wasn't capable of doing that by herself, but rather through the, the power of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, she was assumed body and soul into heaven uh, to rejoice with her son for all eternity. Um, and so hopefully you're celebrating a little bit today. Um, and so, which means that next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, so it's a happy birthday church moment, so make sure you're planning appropriately uh, for that. Um, and then today, get, so getting to the podcast, uh, today we are continuing our journey uh, through man and woman, he created them, and actually we're, we see the end in sight to a certain degree. Um, and we actually are beginning part two. It sounds dumb, but part two, after all these things, of a uh, man when we created them, where he's going to talk about the sacramentality of marriage. And he's going to do this by using Ephesians, so the book of the book of Ephesians. And so today we're just going to be laying some groundwork uh, on this on this book in general um, with uh, Pope St. John Paul II, obviously, and uh, talking about, you know, maybe the first couple of verses and sometimes the most heated verses of, of this book. And so it's very exciting. This is actually one of my favorite letters of St. Paul. And I feel like I say that a lot. I like all of his letters, but this really is, I mean, such a beautiful letter. A uh, fun fact that the longest verse in the entire Bible, it is, it is contained in this letter. Um, it's actually, it's in chapter one. If you read it closely, there's no period for like a super long time. I think it's chapter one verses like, oh man off the top of my head. I think it's like verses like five through like 20 something. Anyway, it's a great, so it's multiple verses, but, but sentence wise, especially if you look at the Greek, uh, there is no punctuation, right? So there's, sorry, there's no, uh, there's no periods, there's no exclamation points, there's no question mark. It's just one giant run on sentence. Um, and especially we have to remember that in Greek and especially Koine Greek, there was no punctuation like at all, at all. If, if you read a, a Greek English New Testament, like today, the punctuation has been added to help us because we just, our brain doesn't work like that. Uh, but in ancient Greek, there was no punctuation and there was no uppercase and lowercase to distinguish between like, you know, names or anything like that. It was all just uppercase. Uh, so really interesting. Um, people back then, they just knew the language though. So it wasn't like anything weird to them, but for us, it's like, what's going on? Um, and so, uh, Ephesians is a really beautiful letter. Um, St. Paul writing to Ephesus. Um, and there's some arguments on like, did Paul write the whole letter? Did he write part of the letter? Did he entrust certain topics to a scribe? Um, and, and that's not really what I'm worried about today, even though they're fascinating questions on the scholarship of, of this letter, um, in the, sorry, the authorship of this letter. Um, what Pope St. John Paul II says though, is that he basically says that he believes that St. Paul was the foundation to the letter where it's all his thoughts and all his, uh, truly some of his words. And that later uh, he entrusted a scribe, namely one of his disciples, um, to kind of expound upon his points, right? What, which ones did he actually write? Which one did he trust? Which verses are what? 
no idea. Some people try to you know, uh, parse that out. I think it's a silly thing to try to do. Um, my personal opinion is I truly believe that St. Paul um, dictated the vast majority of this letter and that maybe a scribe took some liberties here or there. Uh, but regardless, we'd still say as Catholics that the entire letter is inspired scripture. Everything that uh, the sacred author, namely the Holy Spirit, wanted to be held within the letter is contained within the letter. And so looking at Ephesians kind of in its bigger context, right, um, of uh, the letter itself. So the letter is broken up into really uh, three parts. And so in, in the first part, um, we have this idea of, you know, what is the gospel, right? What is um, this this mystery of salvation, right? Um, and, that's, and that's where St. Paul tar- talks about. And then he g- it goes on to this idea of this mystical body, right? Um, what is the mystical body of Christ? What does it mean to be a member of Christ? And then he ends by saying, okay, then now what, right? Um, and, and before Pope St. John Paul II gets into all that, though, is he talks about two meanings of the body that are important to this letter, and then also uh, sacraments in general. And so, before we get into that, Greek word of the day. Uh, a Greek word of the day is peripatete, which is uh, you walk. So, one thing, uh, peripatomen, I think? No. Peri, peripatete is the... Greek for you walk. So you have to remember like in, in Greek, um, and even in Spanish and Latin and other languages too, the, the, the ending of the verb always represents like who it's addressed to. So uh, if it's certain ending, it's I, it's first person, first, or first person singular, first person plural, second person singular, second person plural. So the reason I said uh, peripatete is because in Ephesians 5, 15, um, that's, the, that's the word which means to walk. Um, he says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, is a section here and a little bit further. So there you go. Peri patete. It's kind of a fun word to say. Um, means you means you walk. Um, so, or you are walking is another way to say it. Um, so that being said, Pope St. John Paul II begins with this idea of that we, it's really important for us to know because the part of the letter that he is most concerned about is chapter 5, verses 21 uh, through 33. And this is the letter concerning husbands and wives, right? This is, a, I guess, for some people, it can be a controversial part of the letter. Um, for some, I guess, feminists, like New Age feminists, they can get offended by this part of the letter. But if you truly understand the letter for what St. Paul is actually saying, uh, there's no really reason to get offended. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But... St. John Paul II wants us to know that there are two different ways that St. Paul is using the word body, soma, right, in Greek, um, in, in this letter here. The first is, is as, a, as a metaphor. So we have this idea of mystical body, right, the mystical body of Christ. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, we hear in, in the letter that the mystical body of Christ is the church, right? Um, and this is really important because the analogy, the spousal analogy that St. Paul uses um, it is going to be contingent on this analogy of uh, the church being the mystical body of Christ. And there's also the literal sense, right, of someone, just namely as the physical human body. This is the concrete human body that that analogy is, is based off of, right? Um, it's like analogy on analogy on analogy here. And so the, this part of the theology of the body, Pope St. John Paul II is really trying to talk about the sacramentality of marriage. And so why is this important? It's, well, it's because all sacraments have something in common, right? Namely that they're efficacious. What does that mean? It means that it's, it's, they impart grace. Ex opere operato is the Latin. It, it, so it doesn't matter on you know, the disposition of the minister. They, they impart grace, right? Um, insofar as it is a thing, it imparts grace. And so, so I guess let's track back, you know, what is a sacrament? Well, you know, a, a definition that gets thrown around that you probably heard is a sacrament is, an, is a visible sign of an invisible reality, right? So something like uh, the, the Eucharist, right? It's a visible sign, namely a sign of bread and wine, of an invisible reality of us becoming truly one with the person of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And so it's a, it's a visible sign of an invisible reality. Um, in the sacrament of confession, uh, when the priest raises his hands and says, I forgive you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, speaking on, in persona Christi there, it's an outward sign, namely it's an outward sign of 
him imparting forgiveness by raising his hand and saying those words of an invisible reality of, of your sins truly being forgiven and being redeemed in Christ. Um, and so baptism, right? The pouring on of water, it's an outward sign of, of water washing you physically of an invisible reality of the Holy Spirit truly uh, empowering you and washing you of your sin and, if, and just and, and re, of the stain of original sin and filling you with his uh, eternal goodness and presence. So it's efficacious, right? But then you think about marriage, right? And, and marriage is, is tricky as a sacrament because the question is, when is the grace imparted, right? Because when you receive the Eucharist, it's very obvious when the grace is imparted. It's when, it's when you receive the Eucharist, right? It's when you eat Jesus, right? When Jesus loves you so much that he gets stuck in your teeth. Um, but with marriage, the question is, is, is when is grace imparted? At what moment, or moments, plural, is grace imparted? You know, is it when you say your wedding vows? Is it when you consummate your marriage and renew your wedding vows again and again and again? Is it in the everyday moments of life? Is it, you know, when is it, right? And so JP2 is really trying to dive into that, that question. And it's something that we're not really going to get into today, but he's setting it up. He wants to know the sacramentality of marriage. Um, and so he's using Ephesians uh, 5 here as his like proof text of the text that we need to dive into in order to understand the sacramentality of marriage. Because for Pope St. Chapel II, this is the text par excellence talking about the sacramentality of marriage, the beauty of marriage, and why it's considered a sacrament, right? And so we're going we're gonna to start here in Ephesians 5.22. And, and St. John Paul II says, uh, this is the part of the text where it's the intersection of mystery of Christ and the Christian vocation, right? So just like uh, linguistically, this, we're, we're getting past the point of the mystery of the mystical body of Christ, um, like we talked about, and into the part of Christian vocation. Now, what does this mean for the community in general? What does it mean for the family, the domestic church? What does it mean for the, the spouses? What does it mean for your relationship with your children? He even talks about uh, servants and masters later on. And so we're going to start with 521. We read this. Sorry, we're going to do uh, verse 20. That'll give some more context. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Right, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also should, should so, so as also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. Okay. So wives, submit your, to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the, church, the body of the church. So a lot of people will read this one verse, verse 22, and get really ticked off, right? You know, how dare Christians and Catholics say that wives must be slaves to their husbands and must submit to their husbands? Um, you know, how, how dare, uh, you know, the church try to implement that now? Oh, or, you know, the other arguments, this is out of date. It was in, con it was in cultural context. You know, women didn't have any rights in the ancient world and it was uh, a patriarchy and all this yada, yada, yada stuff. Okay, so... Um, in one sense, if you don't have a proper understanding of scripture and of reading scripture in context, I get where like those people could be coming from. But, you know, hopefully by the end of this podcast today, we can just see that, that that's a total misreading of the text. You know, I even heard priests sometimes like when they when this is a reading during mass and this reading comes up a lot every single year at, at the during the liturgy. And they say, oh, they make a joke. They go, oh, hate reading about this passage, blah, 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 blah. And, and it just, it shows, you know, and they're trying to make light of it, I guess, but it shows just a total misunderstanding of what St. Paul is trying to say here. And it, it fails to see the, the truly beautiful nature of this text. And so St. Pope John Paul II, he starts in verse 21, which is why I wanted to start there. He says, and you gotta remember too, that in the Bible when it was written, when St. Paul wrote this letter, he didn't 
assign verses to it, right? It was a letter. There wasn't like paragraph sections. There, it was just, it was a letter, right? Paragraphs were added later. Verses were added later. Punctuation was added later, all these things. And so a lot of the times when you, when you have your Bible, even in my Bible here, there's a paragraph between uh, break between 20, verse 21 and 22, and there's like a different subject heading. But in the original Greek, it was not like that. It was just a continuous uh, you know, letter. And so in 21, we say submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, right? Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So that's where you have to start. So even before you read verse 22, which is wives, submit to your husbands, it's this understanding that it's going to be a mutual submission, submitting to one another, right? Out of reverence for Christ. So it's a mutual submission. It's not just one party or the other. It's not one party dominating the other party. It's a mutual submission. And what's the motivation for this submission? Out of reverence for Christ, right? Out of reverence for Christ. Uh, f- uh, phobo is the Greek word for uh, reverence. And it's actually the root of phobia, um, fear. And so it's this idea of piety, uh, pietas. Um, and, and piety, fear of the Lord, is a, is a gift of the Holy Spirit that I think a lot of people really suck at. You know, um, I think we forget to ask for this gift a lot. Um, even when I see people go into mass um, and they don't genuflect before they enter the, the, or they're into the church, um, there's not this sign of piety and reverence um, and of ju- uh, justice, right? The, the virtue of religion. Um, and it falls under justice for St. Thomas Aquinas. And so, and piety can, you know, kind of in a natural sense is directed towards like parents and country and all these things, but it's all kind of linked together. And it's this sense of a, a holy fear of Christ, of a, of a piety. So you submit yourself to one another out of reverence or out of holy fear of Christ, because you know that within your vocation in marriage, your duty and your sanctification, your salvation is contingent on your ability to submit yourself to your spouse. So, you know, a few things here. Um, this idea of submitting yourself to your spouse, um, what, is it, what does it mean, you know? Does it mean you're totally obedient in all things? Well, it depends on what you mean by that. You know, one, St. Thomas will talk about obe- the virtue of obedience a lot. And the virtue of obedience is actually one of the, I mean, the best virtues to strive for. And actually the Dominican order of preachers, they don't take vows of chastity and of poverty. They just take a vow of obedience. Whereas most orders take vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience, like we talked about in the show a few weeks ago. And and why is that? It's because for St. Thomas, obedience encompasses all the other virtues, right? If you're obedient to God, the Father, then you're going to be doing all these subsequent virtues anyway. If you're obedient to your order, if you're obedient to your, uh, your, your boss, right? All the other, th- all the other things are encompassed under obedience, right? And so when it comes to being submissive to your spouse, it can look like a lot of things. And I'm not here trying to say, you know, every single thing. Uh, hopefully I can just, uh, lay down some principles that you can then apply. And so most spiritual theologians, St. Thomas Aquinas being one of them, will say that obedience, to be obedient, you should be obedient to people that are even under you as an act of humility, as long as they don't cause you to sin, right? And I think a lot of times within our, within our marriages, I think in modern culture, I don't, I don't think most husbands see themselves as superior to their wives, if you are thinking that right now, and if you do think that, um, don't be a jerk. You're not. You're co-equal. Um, so not co-equal. You're, you are equal. <laughs> um, you, you know, as a, as human dignity, you have the same value, you know? Um, and so wives submitting to their husbands, well, what does it mean? Cause it is different language, right? And it, you know, there's this idea of submitting to one another out of reverence of Christ. But then it says, he says, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. But then he says, husbands love your wives, right? As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So there is this idea of the, the wife submits and the husband loves. Yet we know from verse 21 that there's a mutual submission. So what, what do we read into that? Well, you, 
fall under the obedience of one another. Namely, as long as they don't ask you to sin, you try to do your best to submit yourselves to your spouse's uh, desires or requests or longings or wants. Um, that doesn't mean you just roll over, obviously. If, I mean, if a lot of decisions should be made mutually. But at the same time, as men, and this is theology of the body kind of applied, our bodies tell us as men that we are like the Father insofar as we initiate, right? Even in the marital act, men obviously initiate the act of intercourse. Um, and women's bodies tell them that they receive their natural, natural receptivity. But we also know that it's a mutual uh, co-receptivity, right? Husband gives, the wife receives, the wife gives the love the husband receives. And so wives submit yourselves to your husbands, husbands love, love their wife as Christ loved the church. And a lot of people have been talked about this, but one of the things that JP2 says is that love, if it is true love, agape, right? Self-sacrificial love. Love dispels all subjugation and rather turns it into service. So wives should trust the husband and follow his lead. But the thing is, the husband should love his wife like Christ loved the church. And so his lead should be for her sanctification and to renounce himself in order to love her, right? So the, the, the responsibility, I mean, kind of falls a little bit more on the husband, right? because the wife's submission is contingent on the husband being somebody who dies to himself, who tries to immolate Christ, right? Who is co-crucified with Christ, as St. Paul says, uh, elsewhere. And so it's up to the husband to lead through sacrifice, knowing that he does everything for the sanctification of his wife and his children, and then the, the, the woman, the wife, sees that, right? And then, of course, submits herself to the husband because she knows and trusts that the husband is doing it out of love for her and out of the, the desire for the families and her sanctification, right? Because the wife submits to her husband as to the Lord, right? But we only submit to Jesus because he loves us. He loves us into existence, and he wants our best for us, right? So we submit to his rule, to his divine authority, because we trust him. We have faith in his goodness, in his generosity, in his love, in his sacrificial nature, right? And so the husband then needs to emulate that sacrificial nature. And this gets into, you know, the analogy that we we're talking about of the, the mystical body. So, you know, it's verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, right? His body and is himself its savior. So once again, they're one body in this analogy within an analogy. The, the husband is the head, the, the wife is the body as Christ is the head and the church is the mystical body. And so once again, the body is assuming the head wants what's best for the body, right? And so the, the onus is on the, the, the husband, right? And the wife has the obligation to inform the husband if he is not making decisions based out of sacrificial love and duty to lead the wife to heaven, right? Because that is your first, first and foremost responsibility and duty as a husband is to get your wife to heaven. And if your wife doesn't get to heaven, it's a serious question on what, what, was, what did you do wrong? right? Not that it's, you can't save her, it's Jesus only, but like it's a question of did you do everything within your power to save your spouse, to lead her to Christ Jesus? Because you represented a loving husband and father. You represented Christ to her, and when she looked at you, she was reminded of the love of God and desired to love God more in and through you and your relationship as a husband and wife. Um, so this idea of submission, right? It's a mutual submission. It's it's a co-receptivity, it's, it's cooperation, it's you're submitting to one another because you recognize that in some mysterious way, you represent Christ in the church. So going back to the sacramentality of marriage, it's a visible sign of an invisible reality. Well, what's one part of our invisible reality? It's that we represent Christ's relationship with his church. We represent this idea that Christ being the head of 
desires the salvation of the body and the body, you know, being the body desires to do the will of the, of the head out of obedience, but out of trust that the head wants what the, what's best for the body. And also for Christ gives himself over for his church. So the husband dies to himself in order to serve his wife. Why? Because that's what Christ did for his church, right? And so this is a glimpse into the, the sacramentality of marriage, the visible sign of an invisible reality, the invisible reality being this mystical union between Christ and his church, right? And as spouses, our goal is to reflect that, right? One last thing on sacraments. A sacrament is not merely just a sign, right? A stop sign is a visible reality of the of kind of an invisible reality of like namely the law it says stop but a stop sign can't force you to stop trust me i know i've run a few of them um but rather the sacrament in this analogy could force you to stop right it imparts grace ex opere operato right and so as a married couple you're supposed to represent christ in union with his church which is a perfect union which is a loving union which is a sacrificial union so we have to ask ourselves as a married couple, do we represent that to others and to ourselves, right? When people look at our relationship, when they, they look at your marriage, do they say, oh my gosh, what a beautiful, loving relationship, right? Do their minds get elevated to why are they like this? Is, is, is this like Christ and his church, right? A gentle love, a firm love, a, a love that's controlled yet passionate, right? And so food for thought here. Um, so we're gonna continue into uh, Ephesians. Uh, with uh, man and woman, he created them. Fun fact, we're already on the audience like 85 or 87 out of the 130. So we're like, we're getting pretty close, y'all. We're, get, we're getting there. Um, so once again, thank you so much for watching and or listening to this week's episode of Catholics with Bibles. If you have any questions, have any feedback, let me know. As always, if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you subscribe, hit that button below, subscribe to our channel. If you're listening to this on uh, Apple or Spotify podcast, Make sure you leave a review, give us a like, give us a thumbs up. And until next time, y'all, God bless.